So we are in the Gospel of Mark, as Pastor John has illustrated, uh, and as we've been tracking along, an extremely long worship series. So what I wanted to do was to take the worship series on Mark and do a subset. What was the, I can't remember the name of that movie that was about a dream within a dream within a dream? Inception. Conce Inception. Inception. Not conception. Not conception. <laughs> No, Conception, that was a different movie. Uh, yeah. Inception, there's a dream within a dream within a dream. Well, what we're going to do, we're in the Gospel of Mark, which is its own worship series. And we're going to now, let's see, I did Simply Jesus. We are now going to, for the next three weeks, do a subsection of the Inception and go talk specifically and especially about the paradox of the theology of the cross. Because what we've got going on now in the Gospel of Mark, we've reached this point in time when things, when the waters get a little rougher, when the truth gets a little oh, harder to understand, where it's a little bit more difficult to digest. Which would you rather eat? A glazed donut or broccoli salad? The donut. The donut. Okay, donut usually wins. Teo, would you rather have a donut or broccoli salad? I knew he was going to say that, so that based the rest of my sermon on broccoli salad. How about that? Well, it's because I, Welcome to my world, right there. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for bringing Teo, Charlie. It's, it's, it's going to get better from then. So, uh, we're going to have to unfold some of this. What Jesus does now in, John, or in Mark chapter 8 is take a turn into some very difficult truths. Up until this point in time, people who have been following Jesus have noted a few things, that he doesn't necessarily appreciate the authorities of the day. You'll notice, too, that he is able to do what he says. He is performing miracles. People are healed. Matter of fact, right before we begin in John chapter 8, he heals a blind man in a really, really interesting one that I thought I could go down that road, but that's a whole other story. So we're going to just kind of mention it and then ignore it from that point on. Jesus heals a guy slowly by spitting in his eyes. And the guy goes, well, I, I see that people look like trees, which is kind of what I say to my ophthalmologist when I go get my glasses fitted. And then Jesus redoes it until it gets clear, and it's a whole other thing. But he's doing miracles, and there's a pattern. He does a miracle. He pulls somebody aside. He doesn't want it to be a big show. Then he says, don't tell anybody about this called the Messianic Secrecy, and we talked about how Jesus didn't want to become a showman, didn't want this all to be the focal point. And the reason why he kept this Messianic secret up is because of where we're at today in this subset series called The Paradox of the Theology of the Cross, or The Paradox of Sacrificial Love, or The Weighty Momentum of Putting Yourself First. So the heart of the message here today is going to be this reflex that you and I have, this automatic, autonomic reflex to think first and foremost about us, me. And what Jesus is about to do is say, you know what, for you to make it into eternity, all I want you to do is kill that reflex. Ugh. All you have to know, so Jesus doesn't want to make a better you. Jesus isn't interesting in fixing you. Jesus isn't interesting in making you your best self. Jesus wants to kill you and trust that he will rebirth you. Are you ready for that? Let's go. Thank you, John, for handing me this part. Wow. 
So let's talk about a paradox first. Let's define a paradox. A paradox is a statement or proposition which on the face of it seems self-contradictory, absurd, or at variance with common sense. Though, on investigation or when explained, it may prove to be well-founded, or according to some though, it is essentially true. So you'll know you run across a paradox when you go, Pff. then you go, well, 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 uh, uh, ooh. Uh. Oh, by the way, yes. <laughs> These books will be on sale in the lobby. Um, <laughs> I wrote a book called The Love Paradox. It was based on my doctoral dis dissertation. And the reason why I bring this up is because I have studied biblical paradox thoroughly. I love the study of biblical paradox because therein lies the truth, which is different. I don't necessarily love biblical paradox like broccoli salad, but it's just good for me and unfolds. So the whole love paradox phenomenon is about this. Seven times the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. What does he mean? Why did he say that? Why, what are the contexts of it appearing seven different times? And well, it turns out that the big biblical paradox here and summarized is just this. If I will love myself the way God loves me, if I will care for myself the way God would call me to care for myself, you will be blessed. Actually, the person who will be blessed first and foremost will be Mary Louise, my beloved of 40 plus years. I always get the number wrong, so I just round up. <laughs> the people that will be blessed will be the children that I raised, the family that they raise and the life that we live together in community, if I will love myself the way God loves me, you will be blessed. Go figure. When I was, a, when I was leading a large staff in St. John in Rochester, every summer during the summer lull, we would meet for two very specific and special meetings. The second of those meetings was the, your goals for the coming year. Uh, if we're going to try to elevate worship by 5%, we're going to try to involve more children in the youth group by 10%. We would set goals and uh, make sure that those all sort of lined up and doable and they had the tools to make that happen, blah, 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 blah. The first meeting we would have, though, was before the second meeting, because the first meeting is, goes first, is we would sit down and say, tell me all about the way in which you are going to manage yourself this next year. Show me your devotional life. Show me your vacation schedule. Show me your day off schedule. Show me the books that you intend and design to read. Show me how you're going to make sure that you are there for your beloved and for your family. Show me, and then let's just talk about it. I don't need to know anything too personal, but I want to know that before you engage all these goals and all this work and all this effort to move St. John forward in the kingdom, that you are being taken care of that you understand and know that I'm in support of you taking care of you. Show me your sabbatical days. Show me what's most important to you and how you're going to prioritize that. Show me how you're going to make it up when days off are taken away from you for emergencies. I get that. So that you might know, as you manage yourself well, as you love yourself the way God loves you, this congregation, your family, and your beloved will be blessed. Here's some paradoxes. Some other ones in the Bible, just to kind of give us a flavor. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. All right. That's not too hard to digest. Maybe not. You humble yourself and let God exalt you. But notice the subject changes from yourself to God. Lift yourself up, pull yourself up by the proverbial USA bootstraps, ain't the thing. It's you humble yourself, let me exalt you. Notice in the biblical paradox, there is a loss of control. But the odd thing about that is that it's a loss of perceived control because we really don't have control anyway. 
but I'd like to pretend I do because I feel more comfortable when I believe that I have control even though I really don't have control, I don't think about that. And what this is saying is, no, 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 Carl. Humble yourself before the Lord. Trust that he will lift you up. But I think that, right, when I humble myself before the Lord, he's going to make me get down on my other knee and want me further down to prostrate myself and never let me up. I know this is not going to happen. So I have to stand up on my own. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Now, you may have heard this if you're a Christian for a while, but it's better to go. So, uh, first time the disciples heard this, going, what is it? Greatest among you shall be your servant. Huh. How about this? Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will keep it. Oh, see how each of these requires sort of a broccoli salad digestion? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Each of these moves the locus of control, moves the trust factor, the surrender factor, outside of ourselves to God. And therein lies the scary part. And therein lies the salvation. And therein lies the hope. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is a profound truth, or St. Paul has been drinking. (laughs) (laughs) What? One more time. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness? So now, this isn't a pursuit of it. This isn't running up to people on the street so that they can insult you. This isn't acting like an idiot so that people can persecute you. This is following Christ no matter what, even if it results in weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. And i got to tell you, I have been blessed by the weaknesses of others repeatedly in my 38 years of active ministry. I would walk into a hospital room with somebody who was absolutely hurting or just actually struggling with life, would witness their faith in the midst of what they were going through, and then all of a sudden, I would be stronger. You get it? This is all a taste and a flavor of what it means to engage a paradox because that's what we're doing. We're engaging biblical paradox. And it just goes against the grain. Ugh. The biblical paradox is the summary of something called the theology of the cross. This is also what Jesus is introducing in Mark chapter 8, something called the theology of the cross. This is contrasted with what is practiced oftentimes in Christianity, something called the theology of glory. You'll recognize the theology of glory because the theology of glory is going to promise you good, better, best. More money, more fame, more power. If you'll just follow Jesus and send me money, God will send you more in the mail. I'm being facetious, but you've heard it. Jesus just doesn't promise that. So a theology of the cross is where we're at today is the belief that the cross is the only source of spiritual knowledge concerning who God is and how God saves. It declares our utter inability to earn righteousness, but to depend solely on the righteousness attained by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Our only source of righteousness comes from outside ourselves. I hate that because it leaves me absolutely unable to do anything to redeem myself. And I can't. But he will and does. So this is a theology of the cross. All this is by way of background to say, this is what Mark 8 is introducing. Paradoxical thinking and a theology of the cross that's deep and gristful 
and complex and ends up making you and I, or giving us, you and I, the opportunity to surrender. So, engaging the theology of the cross, this is our text for today from Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 33. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, you may have heard the question before, who do people say I am? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. This is what I learned to do in pastoral ministry and in pastoral counseling, and make it personal. Okay, what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Life changed because Peter said, you are the Messiah. And in keeping with Jesus' pattern, he warned them not to tell anyone about them. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So what's the harshest rebuke that Jesus gave anybody in the New Testament? You would think it would be to the devil. You would think it would be to the Sadducees or to the Pharisees or to the Herodians or the other enemies. You would think it would be to those people trying to do him in. It's not. The harshest rebuke in the New Testament that Jesus gives is to Peter, his right-hand man who has just said, you are the Messiah. But he misunderstood Messiah. He thought Messiah meant that he gets to circle around Jesus and watch Jesus win. Watch a big J appear in his chest. Watch him overthrow the Roman government. Watch him win, win, win. Feed, feed, feed. Heal, heal, heal. And Peter would be there going, that's my Messiah. Jesus goes, that's satanic. That's satanic. That's not just wrong. It's demonic. Because what you have in mind is your own hide, Peter. What you have in mind is how it looks for you your own sense of safety and security. And it's demonic. Too much? This is what I carry behind me. <laughs> My life is like a big train. The average freight train is <clears throat> over a mile long. I looked this up, I don't know these things. I looked it up. The average freight train is over a mile long and has 90 to 120 cars. I thought that serves as a perfect and wor working metaphor for my life because as my life goes on, I hook up more and more things behind me. Preferences, delights, patterns, all the self-centeredness of my life things that I like to do, the people I like to be with, the chores I like to accomplish, the goals I like to have, the fun that is mine. And pretty soon my train gets longer and longer and longer and carries more and more momentum. My selfishness, my ability to think of myself is, is like hooking one more car behind my train and now it's over a mile long then I also looked this up. How long, this, we'll, we'll use this as an interactive part of the message. How long do you think it takes to stop a long train moving 50 miles an hour, which is the classic or the, the regular speed of a freight train? How long does it take? Is he goes, stop now, how long will that take? How long? A mile. A mile. Who said a mile? Okay, that, you get to double your tithe today. <laughs> That's how the theology of the cross stuff works. The point of that is there's a weighty momentum in my life 
of things I have attached to it. So when Jesus tells me to surrender, I can't just stop him. It's like stopping a train. It takes miles, and it's a momentum that continues to carry on and on. All of this is present in Mark chapter 8 when Jesus goes, we're about to make a left turn here, boys, and life is going to get awfully difficult. And that's the way it was planned. How long is your train? So Jesus says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? I just did a real quick search while I was online and thought, well, I looked up like uh, Islam and Jewish and Baha'i and Buddhism and Hinduism, Shintoism. I started scanning different faith beliefs, and this is what I found. That amongst the people, amongst the faiths that are, at least in Google, if Google is to be trusted, they will tell you that uh, these faiths or, faiths or people who don't profess any faith believe that Jesus was a real person, which I thought was interesting. Of all the ones that are listed down there, I thought the fact that 52% of Americans think Jesus was a real person <laughs> was interesting. I mean, it never dawned on me that he was a real, you know, the, oh, well, I guess it's an indictment of our own faith. Either way, so who do people say that I am? People's 52% of Americans, according to Google, say oh, he's a real, a real person good teacher, a miracle worker, a great prophet, a holy man, that he came from God, that he spoke truth from God. So you can see that there's hints of it, but notice that who do people say that I am leaves the locus of control here with us, with them. I can accept or reject the fact that he was a holy man. I could take what I like. I can dice it up. I can slice it up. I can absorb it. I can make the parts that I like good and work on that, and the parts that I think I don't like, I can push those away. I can do that with any of these. Unless I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Now I've taken away all my options. Now it's all or nothing. Because the purpose of the Messiah is to suffer and die. And my purpose is to follow the Messiah wherever he leads. Even if that means I have to suffer and die. You ready for that? Get behind me, Satan. You're thinking about yourself. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Putting myself first is the thing that will kill me. Go way back to the Genesis incident where it's, you know, the story of picking the forbidden fruit gets kind of sidetracked. It's all about the fruit. Or, and I remember in sixth and eighth grade wondering why the fig tree leaf was placed where it was and how you show that and all that kind of odd issues that are going on in that story. What it was was at the center of the garden was God's command and promise. He was the center and around him everything circulated including Adam and Eve. If you spin all the way back to the book of Revelation you'll find that the lamb is at the center of the throne and everything in heaven circulates and revolves around the lamb you'll notice in my world carl is at the center and everything circulates around carl if that's not changed if that's not killed if that's not ended it will kill me because it is satanic. Not bad, not non-optimal, it's demonic. And my train will cause my own death.
The story continues in Mark chapter 8. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me, there's this paradox, and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. It's clear. It's focused. All God wants, this is it, that's all, that's all he wants, is you. That's it. So can you pause this for just a second? <clears throat> and maybe even restart it, put it at the very beginning. I found a nice, brief, well, brief, it's, five, it's almost five minutes, explanation of the theology of the cross, what God is after and what Jesus is calling us to do in Mark chapter 8. It's from a website called gotquestions.org. I think it's, it's helpful about 90% of the time for me in my studies, in my reviews, and my preaching. They've created a nice graphic that explains what a theology of the cross is and what Jesus is calling you and I to do. Okay? So I've added it here right at the end to kind of summarize and illustrate the nature of the theology of the cross. What did Jesus mean when he said, take up your cross and follow me? Let's begin with what Jesus didn't mean. Many people interpret cross as some burden they must carry in their lives, a strained relationship, a thankless job, a physical illness. With self-pitying pride, they say, that's my cross I have to carry. Such an interpretation is not what Jesus meant when he said, take up your cross and follow me. When Jesus carried his cross up Golgotha to be crucified, no one was thinking of the cross as symbolic of a burden to carry. To a person in the first century, the cross meant one thing and one thing only, death by the most painful and humiliating means human beings could develop. 2,000 years later, Christians view the cross as a cherished symbol of atonement, forgiveness, grace, and love. But in Jesus' day, the cross represented nothing but torturous death. Because the Romans forced convicted criminals to carry their own crosses to the place of crucifixion, bearing a cross meant carrying their own execution device while facing ridicule along the way to death. Therefore, take up your cross and follow me means being willing to die in order to follow Jesus. This is called dying to self. It's a call to absolute surrender. After each time Jesus commanded cross-bearing, he said, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit his very self? Although the call is tough, the reward is matchless. Wherever Jesus went, he drew crowds. Although these multitudes often followed him as Messiah, their view of who the Messiah really was, and what he would do, was distorted. They thought the Christ would usher in the restored kingdom. They believed he would free them from the oppressive rule of their Roman occupiers. Even Christ's own inner circle of disciples thought the kingdom was coming soon. When Jesus began teaching that he was going to die at the hands of the Jewish leaders and their Gentile overlords, his popularity sank. Many of the shocked followers rejected him. Truly, they were not able to put to death their own ideas, plans, and desires and exchange them for his. Following Jesus is easy when life runs smoothly. Our true commitment to him is revealed during trials. Jesus assured us that trials would come to his followers. Discipleship demands sacrifice, and Jesus never hid that cost. In Luke 9, 57-62, three people seemed willing to follow Jesus. When Jesus questioned them further, their commitment was half-hearted at best. They failed to count the cost of following him. None was willing to take up his cross and crucify upon it his own interests. Therefore, Jesus appeared to dissuade them. This is very different from the typical gospel presentation. How many people would respond to an altar call that went, Come follow Jesus, and you may face the loss of friends, family, reputation, career, and possibly even your life? 
the number of false converts would likely decrease. Such a call is what Jesus meant when he said, take up your cross and follow me. If you wonder if you're ready to take up your cross, consider these questions. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing some of your closest friends? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means alienation from your family? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means the loss of your reputation? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your life? In some places of the world, these consequences are reality. But notice the questions are phrased, are you willing? Following Jesus doesn't necessarily mean all these things will happen to you. But are you willing to take up your cross? If there comes a point in your life where you are faced with a choice, Jesus, or the comforts of this life, which will you choose? Commitment to Christ means taking up your cross daily, giving up your hopes, dreams, possessions, even your very life if need be for the cause of Christ. Only if you willingly take up your cross may you be called his disciple. The reward is worth the price. Jesus followed his call of death to self with the gift of life in Christ. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Got questions? The Bible has answers, and we'll help you find them. So to draw this to a conclusion, ra rather than a train of issues that are carrying my momentum, this is what I would pray for. That you and I walk side by side with Jesus, totally surrendered, down the track together going, where do you want me to go, Lord? What do you want me to do when we get there? How do you want me to do it? Where do you want me to go, Lord? How do you want me to do it when I get there? That's why we have communion. That's why it follows. We'll have opportunity to respond with the giving of ourselves and tithes and offerings. And we'll have an opportunity for communion because you know what? I can't willingly give it up. <laughs> How about you? I need the work of God's Holy Spirit inside of me, present through bread and wine, body and blood of Christ. I need to call on the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptismal waters to work its power within me to let go and let God. That's why we have communion. That's why we have baptism. That's why we have grace, so that he can work in me what I can't work in me. Gracious God and Father, thank you for the gift of this opportunity that we have to examine the depth and the power and the mystery, the strength of this paradox, to lose our life that we might gain it. Give us opportunity not to be concerned about human concerns and the train of comforts and conveniences that follow us, but rather to unhook them, get off the train and walk down the track with you, to go where you would go, to follow you wherever you might lead to do whatever you might call us to do, that we might die to self in order to live forever, that we might surround the throne of God with the Lamb at its core, that all this might happen, confident you hear, always in Jesus' name, amen.